The Georgia Bulldogs and Tennessee Volunteers get set to do battle at Sanford Stadium on Saturday night. We are here previewing, predicting, and breaking down this game between the Bulldogs and the Balls. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Phillips. He's Dave Shoemate. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications. Check us out via podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us across all social media platforms, as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. Com. This segment brought to you by our friends over at Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com, use promo code SECU at sign up to get $50 instantly when you play your first $5 or more lineup. That's prizepicks.com, promo code SECU to get your $50 bonus today. The Georgia Bulldogs, with their backs against the wall and college football playoff hopes on the line, welcome the Tennessee volunteers to Athens, Georgia for a Saturday night showdown in the SEC. We are here previewing, predicting, and breaking down this game. I am Chris Phillips. Helping me do so is my good friend, once again, Dave Shoemate. Dave, what's going on, my man? I appreciate you taking the time and excited to break down this matchup with you. Yeah, man, this is the big one of the weekend. I mean, it's it, it's crazy. I mean, maybe we did. But we saw this and what I'm about to say. Maybe we were anticipating this because we looked at how tough uh, going into the season, Georgia's schedule was the number one strength of schedule overall, like including the Clemson game. Uh, maybe we did see this as a potential must win for Georgia heading into this one. But it, it's probably not how you drew it up just outside the records. As you know, CP, we always project records, win losses in football heading in. But we also don't really know the – how would we? You, you don't know the contextual layers of these games going into it. It is wild to say. It's like, man, Kirby Smart and them backed up against the wall – Tennessee coming to town, night first night game between Tennessee and Georgia and Sanford since, what, 2006? I think just thinking about it off the top of my head, I think 2006, they've been most of these games at 2.30 or 3.30 Eastern. It, 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 it's playoff or bust. You got, I think Georgia's probably on the outside looking in from an Atlanta standpoint. But Georgia going to be – I think they make their way to the college football playoff with a win Saturday night. Tennessee, Tennessee going to Atlanta – to go play for the SEC title game with a win on Saturday night in Athens, unless they stub their toe down the stretch against Vanderbilt, which I don't think they would. Conversation for another day. But a lot of things on the line here. Georgia has to win this game. Tennessee really needs this game, I think, from a playoff perspective. If we want to look ahead, again, we'll have our playoff, our playoff preview tonight, myself, Chris, and Cole. But really, it, it should be a good one. Night game in Athens. I'm fired up for it, man. I always talk uniform games. I like the Tennessee all-white stormtroopers. <laughs> Coming in, you're going to see the Georgia with the red, red, uh, silver britches. That's always a good uniform game as well. And like I mentioned, we got a ton on the line Saturday night. And Dave, on that note, this is the SEC Unfiltered Tour game of the weekend brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks. We will be in Athens, Georgia for this matchup, Sanford Stadium Saturday night. Also, I do want to shamelessly plug, Dave, uh, I will be joining a panel on Friday at Creature Comforts Brewery in Athens, Georgia. My good friend Graham Coffee of Dog Central. I think Keith Marshall is going to be on that panel as well. Home Field Apparel, also a partner of that. They invited me, Dave, to join them to talk Georgia, Tennessee, talk SEC, and uh, be part of that panel. So, around, awesome. yeah, around 6, 6.30. Haven't even, annou even announced that yet on social media by the time you hear this. I probably have. But uh, really excited, man. We're going to get into Athens Friday. Going to be at Creature Comforts. If you want to come by, say hello. But this is the SEC Unfiltered Tour Game of the Weekend. Cannot wait, Dave, to get to the Classic City. You mentioned, by the way, and I want to start with this, Dave, um, the significance of this game being a night game, night game showdown. Get this when it comes to Georgia, because you were in Sanford Stadium, Dave, earlier this season, and you even mentioned it was for the Auburn game. Kind of a subdued atmosphere. You know, maybe Georgia fans are getting a little bit spoiled. It's it's not quite the the raucous environment. It was a week after the Alabama game. Right. Yeah. We a little bit of a hangover. Even Kirby had something to say, right? About the crowd and crowd involvement. Game, get this, yeah. get this, Dave. I'm gonna give Georgia fans some grace here because of this. Georgia's played 10 of its last 13 games away from Athens. And by the way, I mentioned this because you may have heard Dave Kirby Smart and his media availability this week say, thank God it's at home. Like, thank God for a home game. Georgia's played 10 of its last 13 games away from Athens. Georgia's last seven games against ranked opponents have all come away from Athens, including four straight against top 10 teams. Georgia's three home games over the last year were all against teams with a losing record. Against Tennessee, 
Georgia is going to be playing its first home game in 35 days. They're going to be playing their first home game against a ranked opponent in 371 days. Dave, and finally, it's the first home night game in 371 days. So listen, if G Georgia fans have got every reason to show up this week, then you add on what's on the line. Georgia can be one of the best venues in the country, Dave, if it wants to be. And I got to think the folks in Sanford Stadium know what's on the line, and they're going to show up and show out and be raucous as all hell on Saturday night. Again, 7.30 Eastern time kickoff on ABC at Sanford Stadium. Dave, Georgia right now sits as a nine-and-a-half point favorite. The over-under set at 48-and-a-half. Obviously, we reacted this live on our Sunday Fun Day show a few days ago, and we obviously were, were stunned by this Vegas line. But nine-and-a-half, is where that number still sits. Georgia leads the all-time series 28, 23, and 2. Georgia has won seven straight, Dave, in this series. I think I think the last time Tennessee won in this series was the 16. Jawan Jennings Hail Mary. I think that no. was the last time they actually won. Not Josh series. Dobbs to Jawan Jennings. Yeah, the Josh Dobbs, Jawan Jennings. Uh, last meeting, of course, was last year. Georgia won that game 38 to 17 in Knoxville. So, Dave, again, as we dive into this matchup. I want to start first, because you've been in this building already this year. Thoughts on the environment and, and the factor it can play? Because I feel like a lot of times with Georgia, we're not – I noticed it too, Dave. We're not talking about environment at Sanford Stadium a whole lot because to, to the point of the stats I just read off, for whatever reason, like Georgia doesn't get these big home night matchups. Now they have one. Backs against the wall. Dave, I was in that building last weekend in Oxford, and I saw it firsthand. Ole Miss played like their season was on the line. They played with a certain level of desperation, a certain level of focus. Wouldn't you expect Georgia at home at night to come out with that kind of intensity and energy? They understand what's on the line Saturday night. I mean, we've seen it all year in this league. And again, the Alabama-LSU game last week is kind of the exception to the rule. But I'll say this. Alabama season was on the line last week. So it wasn't like – it's the teams that came in with a little room for error mm. to lose a game when they're going on the road to face the team in a hostile environment where that team kind of like a wounded dog back into a corner. And, you know, I mean, what they say about wounded dogs back in a corner, they'll do anything to fight for their lives. I mean, it's survival. Like – LSU beating Ole Miss. I know some people make well, Ole Miss needed that too. No, LSU really needed that. I mean, we had people going into that game saying it was the biggest game of the Brian Kelly era. Well, what do you know? LSU at home got the job done. Well, you were at it last week, Chris. I mean, hell, you were at both those games, Ole Miss and LSU, and you were at the game last week. Georgia going into Ole Miss last week. Remember, Georgia didn't have to have that game last week. Would they have loved to have it? Yeah, absolutely. But they didn't have to have it. Ole Miss had to have it. Let's fast forward a week. Sanford Stadium at night. Georgia has to have this. I think Tennessee a little more than people want to discuss because of strength of schedule and lack of big wins outside of the Alabama game. They kind of need this mm -hmm. a, a little bit, but I don't think it's to the point. I mean, Georgia, yeah, you lose, you're done. You're not making the playoffs at 93. I still think Tennessee has a shot, a pretty good shot to get in at 10 and 2, but 11 and 1. I mean, they're in Atlanta, they're fighting for that bye uh, to go win the Southeastern Conference. But, no, to your to your point about the lack of opportunities if you're Sanford Stadium, I mean, a lot of it has to do with what Kirby talked about. Again, I know Florida recently wouldn't have helped, like, a top 25 matchup. But, again, that game being at a neutral site, and sometimes you only having three home games affects that. Uh, but, I mean, the schedule next year will be phenomenal for them. You know, Texas, Ole Miss, and Alabama um, all at home. And I think one year – wasn't this one of the years they are supposed to host Oklahoma, CP, and the SEC made them change that? Remember, they had that non-con schedule yeah. before – so I think that hurts too. But I mean, to your point, you asked me how it was against Auburn a month and a half ago. Yeah, it wasn't great, but also too, Auburn wasn't very good. It was a week after the Alabama loss. This is the game where you're kind of like, yeah, if you're a Georgia fan, if you're Kirby Smart, this is the game where it's like, hey guys, you can really have an impact on us winning this football game. Mm -hmm. Because and this is not a shot to Josh Heupel. It's not. It's just something to keep an eye on. Josh Heupel in big games on the road they teams have yeah. not played well. They have yeah. not played well. I mean, the biggest win, give them credit here, 2022, the win in Tiger Stadium at LSU. But, again, that game was at 11 a.m. Like, I'm talking about a night, ruckus environment, that offense. They need to be able to communicate. This is where the Georgia crowd, Sanford Stadium, can truly be, not still in a line from Texas A&M here, but can be that 12th man to have that impact. 
make Tennessee's offensive line ha- have five to six false starts. We have procedural penalty- penalties. Get them in second, third, and longs. This is where Sanford can have a massive impact on Saturday night. And, I, and I'm sure Georgia fans, Dog Nation, are fully aware of the opportunity in front of them to help their team uh, continue their season on the path to the college football playoff. Dave, you mentioned the Tennessee Volunteers. I want to go there next because last weekend, of course, most notably, Nico Iamalayava goes out in that game fairly early in that game with the upper body injury. Uh, Dylan Sampson got kind of his leg bent up. I think he came back in that game and even ran for a touchdown. So I, both of these guys are going to be expected to play. I, I don't think it's anything significant. Josh Josh Hype will even, Dave, went as far as to say in the postgame, hey, this was all precautionary to take Nico out. Um, but the question, Dave, still remains, and I know nobody's 100% this time of year, but beating Georgia and Athens at night is going to be hard enough. With a less than a hundred percent Nico, and I mean, what's the status of Dylan Sampson? Dave, you made a great point going to Mississippi State, and obviously Josh Heupel didn't heed your word at all. I mean, thirty more carries for Dylan Sampson. He's having a great year, but you got to start to wonder: are are we losing some of the tread on the tires? Like, at what point are we like? Is there a game that comes where it's like, man, he just looks gassed? Like it, it just they're running the hell out. Of, they're they're riding him, Dave, till the wheels fall off. And I mean. I, I don't know that that I really expect that to be an issue this week because you know the adrenaline's going to be going. He's going to be fired up. I mean, hell, selfishly for Dylan Sampson, Dave, you look at this game. Like, if he if he went out there and ran for two bills and a few tutties, he moves at, like, one of the forefront of the Heisman conversation. Like, it could be that type of game for him. But, again, two guys got banged up against Mississippi State. They're supposed to be fine. But, I mean, Dave, how much of a concern do you have going into this one, like, you know, beating them at 100% is going to be hard enough. It's like, what are the status of two of your best players? Yeah, and they came out and really said what was wrong with Nico. I mean, I've seen different things, concussion protocol. I've yeah. seen ribs. Like, I mean, I think it's more the concussion. I mean, it didn't say he had a concussion, but maybe he didn't pass a test at, high, at halftime, and they're like, well, he can't play this. He doesn't have a full-blown concussion, but concussion-type symptoms. I, I don't want to speculate, but that's what it sounds like. Um yeah, you're right. I mean, they're banged up a little on offense. Dylan Sampson, you mentioned it. I mean, he only has what, about 20 less carries than Ashton Genty has <laughs> on the year. They've been rolling him, running him into the ground, like you mentioned with Dylan Sampson. Been saying it all year. It's not a Dylan Sampson thing, folks. Like, he's doing as much as he can. It's just with that frame, you can only take so many carries and factor in. It's a longer season now, guys. So you need guys like Peyton Lewis, Cam Selden to step up, Khalifa Keith, help him. Be, someone be that RB2 to take off load. And Josh Heupel's got to be a little bit of aware to worry about the load carry of his starting running back if you want to get him to Tennessee's ultimate goal, which is to win a national championship, win an SEC championship. But I think without Dylan Sampson, it's going to be a lot harder. So they got to find him a little uh, Robin to his Batman there from that mm-hmm. perspective. Deontay Thornton's banged up a little bit. Uh, it sounds like at the receiver spot. And we know Squirrel White's been in and out of the injury 10 all year. Um, I think Chris Brazel's fine. But overall, yeah, Tennessee on offense, a little banged up. You mentioned it, Chris. It's going to be hard enough to do this at 100%, much less um, if you're not at full capability going in on Saturday night in Athens. Something that could help out that Tennessee offense, though, Dave, that Tennessee front seven. I I tell you, watching, again, Ole Miss Georgia in person last weekend, Dave, I have not seen Georgia get physically whipped like that at the point of attack on both sides in a really, really long time. And I say both sides, but especially, I mean, Georgia's offensive front got bullied, Dave. I, they got bullied all night. We put all the blame on Carson Beck, and certainly he deserves a lot of it, if not all of it. But, like, he didn't have a chance in that second half. Prince Uman Mielin, Walter Nolan, Pegues, Ivy, what they, were, per, what they were doing to him. I mean, dude, it was like snap, ball, defenders right there on him. I mean, it just, it felt like, how many fumbles did he have in that game because he's getting hit in the pocket? Dave, Dave, this Tennessee front seven can do what old Mrs. front seven did. How does Georgia counteract that is my question. Like, I'll tell you this, Dave. If I'm Kirby Smart this week, and, and I know this only goes so far, like rah-rah speeches and, and this type, but if I'm Kirby, so I'm challenging my team's manhood this week. Like. You got whipped, flat out whipped by Ole Miss. And Tennessee's going to come in. Dave, I got to think they want to do the same thing to you. They're going to see it on film. I in the sky don't lie. They're going to see it. And I think Tennessee, 
I don't, Dave, if you'd agree or disagree, I think Tennessee's front seven is very comparable to Ole Miss's. Like, I, I think it's very similar. So, like, from that matchup for Georgia offensively, are you able to generate? You're outside of the top 100, Dave, in rushing offense. Georgia, the University of Georgia, is 104th in rushing offense. You know, who are the big playmakers that are going to step up? You know, you're. we talked about Trevor Etienne last week, banged up. They don't really have a second guy there that – who on the Georgia offense is scaring me at this point, and how do I trust Carson Beck? But it starts at the point of attack. If Georgia beats Tennessee, Dave, it is because they rose to the occasion in the trenches and they punched Tennessee in the face. Or they at least counterpunched when Tennessee punched them. That's something they couldn't do last week in Oxford. If I'm Kirby Smart, I'm challenging this football team's manhood. They want to come in, take what's yours, the whole Kirby Smart pregame speech, hype up, whatever. But like, it reigns true. Georgia's not going to win this football game if they don't man up in the trenches and go punch somebody in the mouth. And Tennessee's got a squad. If Georgia doesn't do that, if they don't wake up up front, they're going to get buoyed again and they're going to lose the football game. Yeah, the offensive line uh, hasn't really been great all year. They have been banged up a little bit. I mean, you saw Tate Ratledge come back at right guard last week off the tightrope surgery. Her, saw somewhere someone posted he woke up Saturday morning sick but still wanted to give it a go his first game back from that. But he, he, was, he wasn't good. He, I mean, he wasn't great. Uh, you had Monroe Freeling out there at the right tackle spot not get, doing well. Uh, Ernest Green getting dominated by Prince Lee UMLA. And you're right, just a bad game across the game, uh, across the board. Drew Bobo's having to play some due to injuries. For uh, Georgia, obviously, Mike Bobo's son, the offensive coordinator. Uh, you're right, though. But Trevor Etienne being down, Branton Robinson being hurt, Roderick Robinson being out with the toe, the running back depth is not there. Right now, the only healthy ones you have, Nate Frazier and Cash Jones, and Nate Frazier has a fumbling issue right now. I mean, you've heard it from talking to people at Georgia, why he didn't play a lot after the Clemson game. Like, he keeps putting the football on the ground. And he fumbled twice like, against Ole Miss. Yeah. I mean, I thought the whole momentum got momentum of that game potentially for Georgia to come back and sucked out when they called him um, – when they got him on the screen. When they, they threw the screen and he fumbled that ball out there, it, that kind of sucked the whole momentum out, momentum out of that game. That's where I thought I was like, oh, Miss going to win this football game. But, no, they don't have anyone they can really trust. I thought a little bit they got away from running on the edges a little bit last week. I thought, like, with uh, Dylan Bell – on the edges a little bit in the jet sweep game. Now, again, good defensive coordinators, Tim Banks. I, I would say, Dave, to that too, though, like when I say I haven't seen Georgia get manhandled like that, in a lot, like we made the point about, we talked about this. I've seen Georgia win on the perimeter so much. I, they, they like they don't just bully you on the interior. They, perimeter, they bully you on the perimeter. Ole Miss was blowing it up all night. So it's like they got to get back to just, it's not just offensive line. They got to across the board get yeah, back to winning play, the They definitely miss Ra Ra Thomas and Colby Young. Obviously, they miss Ladd McConkey and Brock Bowers, but they definitely miss those two guys because Ra Ra Thomas and Colby Young are guys who can go win one on one matchups. It's like scheme be damned. If we get them one on one, they're not going to win every one of them, but they give you a great opportunity to, like, you know what? My guy was just better than your guy on that play. They give you a lot of those opportunities. Easy throws for Carson Beck. He doesn't really have anyone he can really trust in that game right now. I mean, I mean, they really don't. I mean, you got what London Humphreys, uh, Dylan Bell's on the strike. I mean, they use him kind of more in the run game as an extra running back at times. You're right. Just don't really have the skill guys. None of the loss and luckies, Oscar Delp, uh, Ben Yurisek, none of them have really stepped up to even come close. Again, no one expected him to replace Brock Bowers. And if you did, I feel like that's just naive and just wasn't a good expectation for you going into the year. But it really haven't even been – they haven't supplemented that at, well, at all. They haven't been able to own the middle of the field like they had the last two years. That's where Georgia's struggling. Obviously, we know Carson Beck struggles. Uh, they don't trust him. I don't really think he even trusts himself um, right now. On the other side, Dave, you know, I, I watched, again, in person, watched Lane Kiffin – I mean, he got in his bag, Dave. That was a beautifully called game. I, I thought Ole Miss was able to hit some things down the field, over the middle of the field. Uh, it felt like to me Lane Kiffin was running – and, and Georgia's defense didn't play badly, by the way, but it felt like at times for a lot of that game, Lane Kiffin was running circles around Kirby Smart and Glenn Schubin. And you're right, by the way. Tennessee's got a road game problem, I think, under Josh Heupel. Like, they've – that's where they've struggled. Granted, it's hard to win on the road. I, I want to be very fair. It's hard to win on the road, but 
that's where they've struggled, right? But I go back to this. Dave, if Lane Kiffin can do it, can Josh Heupel not do it? I, I mean, Josh Heupel's an offensive mastermind in his own right. I, you know, if you want to have the debate of who's the better one, who's the better play caller, who's the better schemer, we'll go there. But Josh Heupel's pretty damn good at it too. You know, so like if 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 Nico, you know, is is we've seen Nico take steps forward, I think, Dave, since the second half of the yeah. Alabama game. He was really efficient against Kentucky. Early on, before he got hurt, Dave, I thought he was really good against Mississippi State. Granted, it's Mississippi State's defense, but if Nico is 100%, continues to do what he's been doing of late, and it's one of Josh Heupel's better called games, especially if you got Dylan Sampson healthy and you got some balance on your offense. I mean, what you say, Dave? Like, I, I, <laughs> If Lane Kiffin can go out there and do it, I got to think Josh Heupel can do it too. I will say the difference is, though, I think is what we talked about right off the top of the show is the, where these games located. The proximity of this game is like that. I mean, is it so hard to go operate offensively like Josh Hype yeah. wouldn't want to on the way? Like you said, to be fair, it, it, and I'm one of the guys who sings this all the time about Josh Hype. Like, yeah, that offense just doesn't really carry, but, or sorry, this offense doesn't really travel. But you know what they have this year that does travel that they haven't had in the past is the defense that I think is going to get more stops than they're accustomed to where the offense isn't going to have to be put in such backed into the wall situations like, man, we're going to have to go out and score them every night. Like, that's probably how they felt two years ago when they were in Athens. Like, again, that was a rain game at kind of Kirby and then went and set They were number one in the country. Yeah. They, 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 and that's similar than you, – you've had new, a couple times at Florida they've been no-shows. Alabama in the second half last year when they were up 13 in Tuscaloosa, they were no-shows. Only they scored again in the second half. Like, there, there's just some performances on the road where you're just like – yeah, that was a complete no-show of a performance. I mean, they weren't great this year on the road at Arkansas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, again, yeah. but to, to preface it, it's not easy to win on the road, but I do – two things can be true at once. It's not easy to win on the road against good teams, but there is something to this, Josh Heupel going on the road in a hostile environment, and I think it's really just a communication type thing. And let's be honest, this will be the toughest game Nico Imailov has ever played in mm -hmm. uh, Saturday night in Sanford Stadium. Dave, finally, before we get into our predictions, Carson Beck. I guess my question, Dave, is how when you talk about this game, how can we trust Carson Beck at this point? I, I mean, it listen, the quarterback gets way too much of the credit, way too much of the blame. But I mentioned this about a week or so ago, and I'll say it again. He's 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 become a liability for the Georgia offense. And I don't think it's a lack of talent issue, but to your point, is he able to get his confidence back? Like, like because he's got the ability. I, I don't think anybody doubts the kid has the ability. But Dave, like, something has to give at some point. Like, does Mike Bobo start? I mean, do you have to kind of game? Play? Like, are you going to limit what you call? Because you're like, man, like, you know, we can't have Carson put us in a bad spot and throw a pick in our own territory and, you know, now Tennessee's got a short field. I just, you know, he's also not getting the run game you're used to to help him. It's it just, I guess I'm wondering, Dave, like where do the answers come from for Georgia offensively? And that's such a dangerous question, Dave, to be asking. And that's such a dangerous answer to be looking for against a defense like Tennessee that they're going to make you pay if you're not put together. Like this defense is more than capable of doing, again, what Ole Miss did and making life hell for Carson Beck and 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 forcing him into some really, really yeah. bad situations. I, I just – where do you fall on your – like? Do you, is there any shred of confidence left for you that Carson Beck can turn it on and, and be something he hasn't been the last five or six weeks? Him by himself, no, because talking to people over the program, I, I – I don't really know if he has that kind of it factor of like, hey, he, he puts a lot of confidence in others and I obviously outside in himself as well. I don't Dave, really by the way, it, will you mention the Carson Beck it factor thing? Huge game for just his overall perception as the Georgia quarterback. You've played like shit lately. You just got beat at Ole Miss. You're seen on the sideline yucking it up and laughing when you're down 15 points. Dave, you think they've turned on him now? Let them lose this weekend, right? I mean, it's just his stock is going to continue to plummet, and he's going to lose all favor with this yeah. Georgia fan base. Because, sure. that, I mean, you already lost. That leaves a bad taste in your mouth. And you're playing like shit. 
and you're laughing on the sideline and you're supposed to be the leader of the organization, it's not going to sit well with people, Dave. Yeah, and I, and I think they got to handle him with care. Like you get your packages at home from Amazon, handle with care. I, you, you totally see how Kirby treats him differently than he treated Sets and Bennett. And again, you, you do have to treat different players different. Because I mean, Dave, he's mean. calling he's calling the kids celebrating yeah. on the or, or with his buddies on the field after the game at Ole Miss. He he came out flat out called him an idiot. Just said he's an idiot. Why are we not bringing that same energy to Carson? Well, I Beck, think he Dave. knows because Carson Beck can't. I mean, they Kirby Smart's smart enough to know they need Carson Beck to go all the way. You coach game. every guy. I agree. You but start killing it. Yeah. I think they know he's fragile from that standpoint. The term used to me from someone inside the building was a mental midget. So I think they understand that. Hey, dude, if I go crush mm -hmm. this guy and I'm ripping his ass on the sideline, I'm calling him out in the press conferences. He's gonna he crumble. Where it's like Stetson Bennett. Hell, we remember after the semifinal when they beat Ohio State when they came back and also won the national championship in 2020. He was on uh, Stetson Bennett's ass in the post game interview on the field. Like, yeah, I mean, our quarterbacks got to play better in the first half. Like, they just are advancing to the national championship. So I think he he knows right. Carson Beck has to be handled very carefully. Like, because if he already doesn't have much confidence, I don't think the team sees him as that leader. But like you said, this is a perception game. This is kind of a legacy game for him at Georgia because I'm talking to people over there, he's going to come. Does he leave now? I like say you lose this game. He's going to come ask for a lot of money. Georgia's going to have to make a decision like an NFL team does now. Babe. Either I think you're worth it or I don't think you're worth that because of what we have to deal with off the field. Well, not off the field, but internally. You're not very liked in the locker room. Kids will see you as a leader, and you're really not producing, dude. So, no, you could go into the portal or you could go to the draft. That will be an interesting season down the line. But I think Saturday night will have a lot to do with that for both sides of this. I'll say this before we get in the prediction, though, CP. Something if you're fired, if you, to look forward to if you're Georgia just a little bit, and this isn't a shot at Tennessee or anything, but mm. the last two games, I think even Tennessee fans would admit, it has not been the run defense's best performance. It's probably been their worst two performances against Mississippi State and Kentucky, nonetheless. And they gave up 170 on the ground to Mississippi State, 179 to Kentucky, maybe switch those. It's something like that. 169 to 179 yards between those two games against Kentucky uh, and Mississippi State. So for whatever reason that is, I, I don't know why they've kind of started to giving up some runs on the ground a little bit. If I'm Mike Bobo and them, though, you got to get that run game on the on the uh, edges going, dude. Because if guys like James Pierce and them can just pin their ears back and come, it could be a long night. You have to make them just freeze for that half second, man. And that is just a great equalizer. You got to help your offensive line out that is struggling, that is beat up right now with some misdirection against some guys who want to pin their ears back. If I'm Mike Bobo, if I'm a Georgia fan, and I want to see if Mike Bobo is making any adjustments, watch for that edge run game on Saturday night. I think that could really help them if they could get that going. We'll see what Tim Banks does in adjustment off that. Yeah, so much as we're talking about Carson Beck, Dave. To your point, if Georgia can't run the football, that might be the bigger issue, to be honest with yeah. you. And, and by the way, mental midget for Carson Beck. Oh, my goodness. That, that just, that's just not what you want to hear ahead of a game like this if you're a Georgia man. Uh, Dave, that being said, dogs and balls, do battle Saturday night, Sanford Stadium. I'll let you start. Lock in a prediction for this one. Who's your pick, Georgia and Tennessee? It's like you said, it's an opportunity for Sanford Stadium to really have a – obviously, I mean, they've they faced they, Auburn, Mississippi State at home this year. But it, let's call it space space. That, this, ain't, this ain't the same thing. Your, see, your team season's on the line. It's win or go home. Tennessee's in town, a team you don't like, former Eastern Division rival you, you play every year. Your back is against the wall. And like we mentioned, we've seen it all year in college football. The team that is the most desperate at home has prevailed at times. Close games, but has prevailed and continued on and moved on. If anything I believe in in my nine to ten years and working in college football is th this is where you'd want to be if you're Jordan. Obviously, you don't want, you, you'd love to have zero losses. You'd love to have one loss. But if you're telling me at the end of the year to probably punch your – a good shot to get in the college football playoff unless you slip up down the road to somebody you're not talking about. Maybe Jordan Tech. Again, Haynes King's a warrior. Love watching him. Maybe. But that's a conversation for another day. But let's just say, for conversation purposes, Georgia wins this. They're going to the college football playoff. This is where Kirby has this team right here at home against an offense he's had a lot of success against. I just don't see 
again, I see some paths to victory for Tennessee. Like you said, I think they got an advantage in the front seven. Granted, it hadn't played – Tennessee's defensive front hadn't played well the last two games against Mississippi State Kentucky. But Georgia really hadn't played great offensively all year outside of a second half against Alabama. Even the Texas game, they got a lot of short fields. But Carson Beck still had three turnovers, three interceptions. Can they put it together – on Saturday night. It doesn't even have to, I think you would agree with this, Chris. It doesn't have to be a complete performance because again, I think Tennessee could have their own struggles offensively as well. I just think at home, back against the wall, Kirby Smart led team. I think a lot of people are going to be picking Tennessee this week. Now I don't blame them. I'd take Tennessee in the points. I mean, it opened up at 13 and a half, some places, 11 and a half, which said nine and a half now. Mm-hmm. I just can't pick against Georgia in this situation. I know I picked Georgia last week against Ole Miss. This is one of those I would be really shocked if they lost. Not a blowout. I think it's going to be a close game. It's just, man, if we told you Georgia had a shot to go make the playoffs against Tennessee in the middle of November at home in a must-win situation, they didn't get it done against another Tennessee offense that struggled some this year, I would be surprised. I just think you see some new wrinkles on offense for Mike Bobo. I think they get a little bit of that edge game running. I think Carson Beck's okay but I don't think he can have two turnovers. I think he has about one. I think he plays one of his better games. Again, still not sold on him. I'm talking about a guy I just called a mental midget. Just something tells me, man, it's the 2024 college football season. I think he rises to the occasion. I think the defense plays well, but I'll say this. I think the crowd really affects this Tennessee offense on Saturday night because they have to, and they know they can make a big impact, and that is massive in college athletics, and that's why we love college athletics. I think Georgia's going to win this game 27-20, CP. I, I just I have a hard time going against Georgia in this situation at home. You mentioned Kirby saying, thank God this game's at home. My pick would be flipped the other way if this game was in Neyland. I would not trust Carson back at all in Neyland Stadium. So, yes, this game has a massive to-do about where this game is. It's in Sanford Stadium Saturday night in Athens. Can't go against Kirby Smart in Georgia. Give me Georgia. I think they're going to get the 27-20 win, but I will take the points with Tennessee. Yeah, Dave, to your point about the points, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, we we were shocked when, you know, you read off the number. Georgia opens as a 10-point favorite, 11 point. I mean, we were shocked. I mean, we were truly yeah. shocked. I mean, this was – we were fresh off of what happened this previous Saturday, and it just was stunning to me to hear that, man, they're, they're still – a double-digit favorite against the Tennessee team that's pretty good. And, Dave, like, when you look at the matchup, like, I know you can't do this because it matters. I'm going to get there in a second. Take where it's played out of the equation. Take the intangibles out of the equation just from personnel. There's a lot of reasons why Tennessee can win this football game, in my opinion. Like, I I think they've got the right offensive mind in Josh Heupel. I think they've got a quarterback in Nico Iamaliaba that's taken – steps forward, especially since the second half of that Alabama game. He's been much more efficient. Even though the receiver room has been inconsistent, Dave, they got weapons out there that if they're on their game can give Georgia, I think, a lot of problems. Um, Dylan Sampson's one of the best backs in the entire country. You get him going. Tennessee's offensive line, I think, can at least hold their own, excuse me, against a really good Georgia defensive front. On the flip side, I mean, Ole Miss's front seven, dominated Georgia all night. I I mean, it just, they never, the only reason Georgia scored a touchdown in that game, Dave, was because of the early turnover and they had a short field. And even when they had a short field, Dave, they had to go to fourth down to get it in. It wasn't like they just strolled in the end zone. So Tennessee, that front seven is very comparable. Like, I, I mean, the path to victory and from a personnel standpoint, I think Tennessee absolutely can win this football game. For sure. Dave, the more time has passed since I learned of the line on Sunday, and it's come down to nine and a half, the more I've stewed over it. Dave, the more I feel like it's a sucker line. It just, it's, when, listen, when it's when it's too easy, it is, Dave. Like, when, when it's too easy in Vegas, it is. And we're sitting here saying, like, how can the spread be nine and a half? How can it be eight and a half? How can it be nine? How can it be so high? I think Kirby Smart, Dave, and take this for what it's worth, I think Kirby Smart is going to challenge his team's manhood this week. I really do. I think we're going to get that typical, whether it's pregame, whether it's this week in practice, whenever maybe it's all week long, that typical Kirby Smart, that speech you hear that finds its way, gets leaked. They want to come in. 
take what's yours. All I want to do is fucking eat like that. They were going to get that type of speech, that type of hype up from Kirby Smart. Dave, I got to think Georgia turns back into Georgia at some point. And I know all year they haven't really been that team. Granted, I say they haven't been that team. They turned back into Georgia and Austin. They, they turned back into Georgia against Texas. At least defensively. Yeah. At least, de again, the turnovers is what has been killing them. Georgia's defense has been doing all they can for the most part. Like, the turnovers, Carson Beck shooting them in the foot – their defense, I think, they've still got dogs, literally and figuratively, on the defensive side. You make a great point, Dave, and, and I'll say this. You make a great point. As I prepare to embark for Athens, Georgia, and Sanford Stadium, and it's been a long time. I haven't seen a game there, Dave, in over 10 years. 2014 was the last time I was at Sanford Stadium. And I hear people say things like, it, it's not an intimidating atmosphere. It's not very loud. You know, Sanford Stadium shouldn't be considered one of the most hostile environments in the SEC. There's so many more places that are more difficult to play. I call bullshit, Dave. When Georgia wants to be loud and Georgia wants to be hostile and Georgia wants to be one of the toughest places to play in the country, it is. We got to think the SEC East has kind of been down in the last few years. So, I mean, what, and then Auburn's about to be in their fourth straight losing season. What big home games has Georgia had opportunities yeah. to like really get rocking and rolling here recently? I mean, really not a, since Tennessee 2022 and maybe what Notre Dame 2019. Yeah. And, and I think this is one of those moments, Dave. Again, people question the intensity, the hostility of Sanford Stadium, the hostility of the folks in Athens, Georgia. When Georgia wants to be loud and hostile, it's one of the best environments in all of college football. I think this weekend at Sanford Stadium, Georgia fans have the opportunity to make the difference. I think Georgia, Dave, turns back into Georgia. I think Georgia wins. I think Georgia covers nine and a half. I, I, I just, something is telling me the line sniffs of sucker line. It's begging you to take Tennessee. I think Georgia is the right side to be on here. I think the dogs – I think Kirby's going to challenge this team's manhood this week. I think they're going to answer the bell at home, at night, season on the line. They're going to play that way with a certain level of desperation that we haven't seen from Georgia of late. I think Carson Beck finally – I don't think he's going to be perfect, but finally is able to not kill his own team's chances of winning the football game, but more importantly – I think both sides of the line of scrimmage, I think Georgia will step up. I think they emerge. I think a running game gets going. I think they're going to force Nico Iamaliaba into a few mistakes. And I think Georgia is able to pull out the win. Backs against the wall at home. There will be no better atmosphere in all of college football, Dave, than Saturday night in Athens at Sanford Stadium. Miss me with the Sanford doesn't get loud bullshit. When Georgia fans want to make an impact on the game, they do. Sanford Stadium is one of the best environments in college football. When Georgia wants it to be, it will be on Saturday night. I got Georgia getting a 27-17 to 17 win. I think dogs win. I think dogs cover backs against the wall, make a statement. Georgia gets that when it has to have to keep, to keep their college football playoff hopes alive. So yeah. no, I, it just know, it I, screams I sucker game. bet. I think it's, Sanford Stadium is going to be the difference, but also, too, I still think Georgia has their issues that Tennessee is going to take advantage of in this game. So I think it is going to be a little bit of a sloppy, ugly game from a standpoint of I mean, both these teams hadn't played a complete game all year. I mean, even Tennessee's win against Alabama wasn't pretty. Not, I mean, across the board, both teams didn't really play that well in that game. And then Georgia hadn't put a complete game together. I mean, defensively they have, but with all three aspects, offense, defense, special teams all playing the same page, no. So, I mean, if we're heading into week 12, Nothing thinks that's going to change. I just think – I just don't know if Tennessee goes in this environment that I think it's going to be like on Saturday night and wins. I think that it's going to will that – I think it's going to help really will Georgia do a victory on Saturday night. So, guys, do you agree with us? Do you disagree? Who do you see coming out on top when Georgia and Tennessee do battle at Sanford Stadium? Guys, that's going to do all for us. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in. Again, make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications. Check us out via podcast, wherever you get your podcast. You can also find us across all social media platforms as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. For Dave Shoemate, I'm Chris Phillips. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in, and we will catch you on the other side.